Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we come to you for your hope today. We pray that you will open our hearts, that we will be so willing to listen to you, that we will understand your word and walk closer to you. Be with us the rest of our time together, and may your name be glorified today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. It's my delight and joy to be here today uh, to study the Word of God uh, with you all. I am really honored uh, for this privilege, and I'm here with my uh, wife, Kim Ngai Ching from Churachanpur, and my sister in law, Muan. Uh, they're somewhere down there. Could the stand, please. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> All right, thank you. Thank you. Have a seat. Uh, <coughs> I am also so thankful to. I'm also so thankful to Gospel for All uh, Ministry for his invitation to uh, study God's Word uh, with you all. It's only because of their kindness that we are all here together. Thank you so much. Uh, the topic we are going to study today is called the Kingdom of God. Um, and when you hear this, maybe some of you know enough to think that, oh, we are going to study some important doctrine. But I want to let you know that this is not simply theoret theoretical doctrine. It is practical uh, doctrine that we are going to study. There is no other doctrine that's more practical than this to me. And this has changed me more than anything else uh, besides the Bible, the scripture. So we'll study this together. And I'm going to be really, really quick uh, so that we'll have time to do some discussion in, at the end. This is a topic that I usually teach for a week. It's 78 pages, but we'll try to do it in four hours. So just imagine how much uh, we're going to summarize. Uh, <coughs> And there is a good book, really good book, uh, written in a very plain language and uh, in PDF. If you would like it, if you would just let Brother James know, uh, I can send it to him and then he can watch up you if you want to read at home. There is a wonderful book which has changed me, as I have said, more than anything else besides the scripture. Uh, it's a wonderful book written by uh, George Lett. It's called The Gospel of the Kingdom. So let's go straight uh, to our studies. What is the kingdom of God is our first chapter. I think you have your hand out. We'll try to follow that. Maybe here and there, there will be a bit of uh, some, some changes, but we will stick to that mostly. What is the kingdom of God? And some introduction, when we study the Gospels, what is the single topic that Jesus emphasized most? I, whenever I go to Bible colleges, when, when I teach this, I, am, uh, I, I take uh, time to ask students the same question. What, what is the single topic that Jesus emphasized most? I'm shocked to let you know that many students will say justification by faith. People think that Jesus taught justification by faith in the Gospels. Before Jesus died, Jesus talked about how we can be saved through his death and resurrection. And some people think Jesus talked about love, but Jesus talked about love only twice in, the whole, in his whole ministry as far as we have the records. And Jesus, people think that Jesus talked about truth, and he talked about truth, of course, but that's not everything. 
The answer is the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God. It isn't love, justification by faith. It's not grace or even heaven. We also, but when we say the kingdom of God, we also encounter another expression, and it's called the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven. Uh, the kingdom of heaven is found only in Matthew. Uh, it's not found in Mark or Luke or John or, or anywhere else. It's only in Matthew that we find the kingdom of God, you, as you can see, is found 32 times. What is this? Is this the same as the kingdom of God? Or is this something different? The kingdom of heaven versus the kingdom of God. Um, this is key to understanding the rest of the lessons. Uh, one of my teachers took pain to study this uh, when I was a student in college. And he studied with us one week in trying to explain that these two things are different. All right? Uh, he thought they were two different things, but let's see. One, I worked with Bible translation organization, and when I was translating the scripture for uh, helping the translators for many languages, one day I realized that, wait a minute, these two are not different. And so we'll see. Uh, Matthew 19, 16 to 25, uh, we'll have the text here so you don't have to go. We don't have time, as I said, uh, to, to dwell on the Word of God for so long. We'll be quick. So everything is here. Everything that we're going to read, all the verses should be here. Uh, if you want this PowerPoint, I can also send you this as well. Matthew 19, 16 to 26 helps us to understand that the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven are the same. A young man came to Jesus saying, Teacher, what good deed must I do to have eternal life? So first, he wants eternal life. But Jesus says, if you would enter life, keep the commandments. All these I have kept, the young man says. Jesus said to him, go sell what you possess and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come follow me. When the young man heard this, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. And Jesus said to the disciples, truly I say to you, only with difficulty would, will a rich man, a rich person enter the kingdom of heaven. Now he wanted eternal life. He is unable to fulfill the requirements. And, but Jesus doesn't say, okay, now the rich man cannot get eternal life. That's, what, that's, that's not what Jesus said. Jesus said it is difficult for the rich person to enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, I tell you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. And you, as you can see that Jesus is using the two terms, the two expressions interchangeably. This, they are the same thing, but uh, ex, uh, ex, the same idea explained by using different words. When the disciples heard this, they were greatly astonished, saying, Who can, who then can be saved? Now, the first one, eternal life, and the last one, saved, are the expressions we often use. We like the two expressions, eternal life. We all say we have eternal life. We all say we are saved. But we don't like the two words, the two expressions in the middle because there is a reason for that. But as you can see from this simple story, you know that the four expressions are the same. Getting eternal life is the same with getting, entering into the kingdom of heaven or entering into the kingdom of God or being saved. The four expressions are one and the same. So keep that in mind, Matthew 19 uh, as we study the kingdom of God, because this story is so key to understanding what we are going to uh, learn the rest uh, of the day today. Some examples, if you are still not convinced, the kingdom of God is equal to the kingdom of heaven. Let's see. 
Um, Matthew 8, 11, Jesus says, I tell you, many will come from the east and west and recline at table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But this is also found in Luke. It's, Luke says, people will come from the east and west and from the north and the south and recline at the table in the kingdom of God. It's the same story. Matthew always says the kingdom of heaven. Of course, a few verses he says the kingdom of God. But Luke always uses the kingdom of God and never uses the kingdom of heaven. No other writer in the, the Bible uses the kingdom of heaven except Matthew. So again, the same story, but uh, two evangelists use two different expressions. Another verse, but, I, but go rather to the lost ship of the house of Israel and proclaim as you go, saying, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Jesus sent out his disciples and he says, go and preach the kingdom of heaven in Matthew. And in Luke, Jesus says, verse 2, and he sent them out to proclaim the kingdom of God and to heal. So again, the same thing. We have two verses here again. Matthew uses the kingdom of heaven. He put another parable before them saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a man who showed good seed in his field. And Mark, he said, The kingdom of God is as if a man should scatter seed on the ground. So this, again saying, in the same story of sowing the seed, we have the kingdom of heaven uh, in Matthew and in Mark, we have the kingdom of God. What exactly is the term, is the meaning of the term kingdom? When we think of kingdom, we think of a land ruled by a king uh, over his people. So we always think in terms of land because of our democracy. Uh, we think of your kingdom come. Uh, we pray and say, Lord, may your kingdom come. Uh, by that prayer, what we actually mean is may heaven come. May your uh, age to come, come. But is that the meaning? What exactly is the meaning of the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God? Let's see that. In the Old Testament, the kingdom, there was a promise. And so in, when we come to the New Testament, here is what Mark says. After John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee proclaiming the gospel of God and saying, The time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Now when, he say, when it says the time is fulfilled, it has the idea of uh, prediction in the past. That something was said about it and therefore it says the time is fulfilled. So what exactly was foretold? In the past, Genesis 3.15, I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. This is said to be the first gospel in the whole Bible. That there will be conflict between the seed of the serpent and the seed of the woman, and victory will be won through conflict. And that's why we have a cruel cross in the New Testament. Why didn't Jesus die a peaceful death? Why was it necessary for him to go through that cruel path of Golgotha? And you think that carefully, this is the only reason. That future victory of the son of the woman will be through conflict. Uh, it's, it's true the, in the whole scripture, the whole narrative the, the, the suffering of uh, Abel, the suffering of Noah, the suffering of Israel, the suffering of Joseph, the suffering of David. And victory is always won through conflict. And that's, this is, the, this is the, um, the prediction here. The seed of the serpent will be defeated by the seed of the woman through conflict. He shall bruise your head and he, you shall bruise his hill. So that's the, the, the first promise. In Genesis 49.10, it says, Jacob is 
blessing his children and when he comes to De Judah he says the scepter shall not depart from Judah nor the ruler's staff from between his feet until tribute comes to him and to him shall be the obedience of the peoples in the Bible when you people is already plural in the Bible when you see peoples with s it means nations so you to him shall be the obedience of the nations, the whole wall. So the ruler of the whole wall is already prophesied in Genesis 19 uh, by Jacob saying that it will be through the son of Jacob, Judah. In Numbers, we have, prof, uh, we have a story of Balak and Balaam. And many people think Balaam was a prophet, but he wasn't. He was a diviner. He is trying to curse the Israelites, but God controls him uh, just like God controlled his donkey and was able to speak. Now, Balaam ended up prophesying good things for Israel. And here is what he says, I see him, but not now. I see him, but not near. A star shall come out of Jacob. And a scepter shall rise out of Israel. It shall crush the forehead of Moab and break down all the sons of Seth. Now who was Balaam? A side note on Balaam. Balaam is explained in Joshua 13 and it says, Balaam also the son of Beor, the one who practiced divination. Right? Balaam was the one who practiced divination. He was not a prophet. Therefore, when Israel conquered the land of Canaan, as soon as they entered there, the first thing they did was kill Balaam because he was responsible for the sins in the Mount of Peor and for the adultery and fornication. So it says, Joshua 13 says, And Balaam was the one who practiced divination and was killed with the sword by the people of Israel among the rest of their slain. So he was one of the slain uh, ones. First, uh, second Samuel 7. Now, now, these things you could study at length uh, for, for the whole day, but we're just jumping. I'm just going to some key verses. Second Samuel, to David, God promised a throne to his offspring. God says, when your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring after you, who shall come from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. So it's not talking about David's earthly throne. It's talking about a kingdom that will last forever, and your house and your kingdom will be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. So where is this Davidic throne now? We have theological problems. Many people think Jesus offered the kingdom. The Jews rejected it. The kingdom is postponed until the millennium. So how can you say that the kingdom is postponed when God says the kingdom, his throne will be established forever? In Psalm 60, the psalmist says, Gilead is mine, Manasseh is mine, Ephraim is my helmet, Judah is my scepter. I think you know what a scepter is. A scepter is a stick that a royal, a king uses. So it's talking about, whenever you see scepter, it's talking about a king. Uh, it's, it's, it's a figure of speech where you use something for something else. For example, in Manipur, we'll say, hey, rickshaw, come. You know, you're actually calling the driver, but you call the rickshaw. Or you use something for something else, you replace it. So when Bible says the scepter will never depart, the scepter will be there forever, it's talking about the king and his kingdom. So one thing for another. Um, in his days, may the righteous flourish and people abound till the moon be no more. May he have dominion from sea to sea. Their king, the future king, have dominion from sea to sea and from river to the ends of the earth. Psalm 72. 
is a, a messianic psalm, Psalm 2 and Psalm, psalm 72 are the, the clearest of the messianic psalms. Some key references. Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall give birth and bear a son. And you call his name Emmanuel. So we are, we are we're just going through the, the whole Bible very quickly trying to find the promises of the coming of a king uh, for this world. Uh, but when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of woman, born under the law, Galatians 4.4. 4. Uh, for to us a child is born, to us a son is given, a government shall be upon his soldier, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of his peace there will be no end. And the throne of David and over his kingdom. Right? It's always about the throne of David. Zechariah 9 9. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. All, there, there are prophecies all along the scripture leading up to the New Testament. The, then the seventh angel blew his trumpet, and there were loud voices in heaven saying, The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord. And of his Christ and he shall reign forever and ever. That's what we see at the end of the whole Bible. And so it's about God's rule from the beginning and God's rule at the end. His rule from the beginning till the end. And what God is trying to do is to establish his rule and reign here on earth today. <clears throat> Revelation 12, I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now... The salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and authority of his Christ have come. That has been God's purpose all along, all along. At the end, at the end in chapter 22 of Revelation, the Bible says, I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you about these things for the churches. I am the root and the descendant of David, the bright morning star. It's all about David and his son and his reign forever. Now, what exactly is this, is this kingdom? The, uh, the word kingdom, as I have introduced already, that we always think about land and people and a royal over them. Let's see this in the scripture. The Hebrew word is malkut. You don't have to know that. The Greek word is basileia. But uh, just for the sake of our studies, I, I provided those just in case uh, there is someone who is interested in that. The primary meaning of both the Hebrew word Malkut in the Old Testament and of the Greek word Basileia in the New Testament is rank, authority, salvation, exercise, sovereignty, exercised by a king. It's rank, it's authority, it's sovereignty. It's not referring to a piece of land. Examples. The abstract idea of rule, instead of when I say the abstract idea, it's the rule, uh, not, not, not land. Uh, the abstract idea of Malkut is found in parallelism with such abstract concept, concepts as power, might, glory, dominion. In Hebrew, they are so... Uh, it's, it's very, Hebrew poetry is very interesting. Uh, they will say the same thing by using different words. For example, uh, Jerusalem is mine. Judah is mine. It's trying to say the same thing. Uh, let's see some examples here. Daniel 2.37 You, O king, the king of kings, to whom the God of heaven has given what? The kingdom, the power, and the might and glory. They are not different things. They mean exactly the same in the scripture. Daniel 4.34 At the end of the days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted my eyes to heaven, and my reason returned to me, and I blessed the Most High. For his dominion is an everlasting dominion. 
and his kingdom endures from generation to generation. If you look at the two lines, the, the last two lines, you see his kingdom, uh, his dominion is the same as his kingdom. The, the two black words in bold are the same. His dominion is the same as his kingdom, and the, the, red, the words in red is an everlasting dominion, is the same with endures from generation to generation. So, in Hebrew, it's very common for people to express, authors to express the same thing in two different ways. So, kingdom and dominion are the same there. Again, Daniel 5. This is the interpretation of the matter. Mene, God has numbered the days of your kingdom and brought it to an end. Now, Belshazzar was defiling the vessels, the holy vessels from Jerusalem. There is a handwriting on the wall that says, Mene, Mene, Tekelu, Parson. You know that story. So the interpretation is, God has numbered the days of your kingdom and brought to an end. And if it refers, if the kingdom refers to the land, the land cannot end. What ends is the rule. Do, do you understand? What ends is the rule. The land cannot end. <coughs> Further example, Daniel 7. And to him was given dominion and glory and, and a kingdom. His dominion is an everlasting dominion and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. Again, his dominion and his kingdom are the same. Everlasting dominion and one that shall, never be, that shall not be destroyed are the same. Again, what we're trying to say is that kingdom does not mean land. It means, it, the meaning of the word kingdom in the Bible is abstract, is dynamic. It's a, it refers to rule of God and the reign of God, not a piece of land. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and your dominion endures throughout all generations. Another verse from Psalms. And fast forward to Luke. Jesus comes to Jerusalem. Chapter 19 of Luke is Jesus' last journey to Jerusalem. He lives, he walked and lived mostly in Galilee. He is headed to Jerusalem and that's his last journey. He is going to die there. And as he comes to Jerusalem, his followers thought, okay, now he is going to establish a kingdom. He knows their thoughts and so they... they this is what Jesus says. And when they heard these things, he proceeded to tell a parable because he was near to Jerusalem and because they supposed that the kingdom of God was to appear immediately. They thought, wow, he is coming here. He is going to start the kingdom of God. And he said to them, he said, therefore, a noble man went to a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and then return, how could somebody go to a far distance, receive a kingdom and bring his kingdom? If it was referring to a land, we can never take a land to another place. So what is this trying to explain? It's trying to say that the, the, the kingdom the Bible talks about is the rule and reign of God. It's like our, our ministers candidates will come to Delhi and re receive the, the power to be the chief minister and go home. It's talking about the rule and reign of God. So the kingdom means the rule, authority, and sovereignty exercised by a king. Keep those things in mind because it's going to be very, very important towards the end. The background for Old Testament hope, the the title of Old Testament hope is the day of the Lord. It begins with judgment upon Israel. The, if you read the Old Testament carefully, you will always find this hope, the day of the Lord. When the day of the Lord comes, two things will be, two, two things will be there. One, it's the judgment of the sinners and it's salvation for the righteous. And those two concepts are explained by this expression, the day of the Lord. And the day of the Lord will eventually um, be the inauguration of the kingdom of God. As the, the Old Testament hope is the day of the Lord. The character of judge, judgment is justice above everything else. 
The day of the Lord will begin and there will be justice. There will be peace. Everything will be put to right. When the king comes, everything will be put to right was what they thought. Because the day is the Lord's day, it will also be a day of salvation for the righteous. But when Israel lived in the land of Canaan, they had kings and people rebelled against the word of God and God Almighty. They were so sinful that God said, now I'm going to pluck you out of this land, Canaan. Uh, as prophesied in Deuteronomy chapter 20, 28, God said, you live in that land, but if you're sinful, I'll pluck you out and send you to a foreign land. You'll be um, exiled there. And so... When, when Israel was in the land of Canaan, they thought that they were mediating God's kingdom. They were supposed to be priests of this earth in, in leading the nations to Yahweh, uh, to God, but they were not living in, uh, in fulfillment of that. They became so sinful that God had to punish them. Their hope, the Old Testament hope, was shattered. So when the Jews returned to their land, they, they went to Babylon, lived there for 70 years. God raised up the spirit of Cyrus, King Cyrus, the king of Persia, who was not even a child of God. He sent Israel back to Jerusalem to rebuild their temple and live in that land. When they came back, they thought, okay, now we were sinful. God sent us for, the, for, for our sins and now we are back to our land and our king is going to come and he is going to rule. Finally, we'll have a king now. We have the temple now. We'll have the king. Zerubbabel built a, king, a, a temple. But their hope was shattered. When the Jews returned to their land, they renounced their former idolatry, giving themselves devotedly in obedience to the law as never before. The Jews never worship idols again. All right? Never had Israel displayed more heroic devotion, devotion to the law in the day, uh, uh, than in the days of the Maccabees when many devout Jews gladly suffered torture and martyrdom rather than betray their devotion uh, to God and the law. It should be to God, not go God. So the Jews came, those who returned were so devoted to God, they, they fulfilled all the requirements, but the, but the kingdom never came. The kingdom never came. Israel was no longer an apostolic backsliding people. They were devoted to God. They were so um, careful about the laws of Moses. She was devoted to her God and obedient to the law. She spurned idolatry and meticulously separated herself from uncleanness. However, in spite of Israel's faithfulness, God's kingdom did not come. The bloody period of the Seleucids was followed by a century of Jewish independence, but the increasing worldliness and Greek-loving ways of the Hasmonean rulers proved that this was not the kingdom of God. The, the period in between the Old Testament and the New Testament is about 400 years. During this period, the Jews were so devoted to God, but the kingdom of God never arrived. They died. They were willing to die for their God and the law of God. But they begin to love the ways of the Greeks, the, 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 the people, the rulers of the then wall, um, Alexander the Great and his kingdom influenced uh, everyone in those days. And so they, they realized, the devoted Jews realized that this is not the kingdom of God. Finally, with the appearance of Pompey in Palestine in 63 BC, as the, Rome, the arrival of Rome in Israel, they thought this is the end. Rome is marching on the road. Everywhere is Rome and the army of Rome. And they, they were so frustrated that at the end they said, if there is a kingdom of God, it must be in heaven, on earth, Rome rules, was what they said. 
If God rules, He rules they are not here. They thought God had forsaken them. Here, Rome rules. Rome rules. And they were longing for the rule of God, the son of David, the root of Jesse, to come and rule and just destroy Rome. Because Israel was, instead of being a kingdom of priests, Israel was like football for their neighbors. Everybody will kick them. The, the, the Egyptians will try to go up to conquer, and on the way is Israel, so you defeat Israel and go up. And the north, the Syrians will try to come down to Egypt, and on the way down you go, you go and destroy Israel and go. So it was, Israel was in the, in the junction, and everybody wanted to touch Israel. Israel was like table tennis bowl in those days. So they were so tired. They were longing for a king who will just destroy all this oppressing kings. We want a king. We want the rule of God here. Now, let him come and rule us and destroy all the kingdoms was what they hoped for. But instead of nations flowing to Jerusalem, right? Instead of nations coming, people coming to Jerusalem, Israel was scattered everywhere, everywhere. Everything was going op opposite to the, the, the hope they had. Instead of righteousness, they had to work hard. Gloom sets in. But they just kept their hope alive in the midst of the in intense opposition. Let's fast forward 20, 200 years from Malachi. Malachi, without independent existence, Israel was a te like a table tennis bowl. Among this group, a term of their hope change. Instead of the day of the Lord, instead of the kingdom of God, those who studied the scripture in those days, they never claimed themselves to be prophets, but they, they, they were willing to study the scripture and change their hope. Change their hope. The perplexing situation demanded a new interpretation of the hope of the kingdom. Because what they hoped for never arrived. The apocalyptic writings, when I say apocalyptic, it means all the writings within the intertestamental period, uh, Malachi to Matthew, the 400 years. Uh, the apocalyptic writings provided such reinterpretation. They had to restudy the scripture, the Old Testament, came up with a new interpretation because their old interpretation was not becoming a reality. The, the, the old way of interpretation was God will come, destroy everything. Destroy everything. But that was not coming. That was not coming. These people now hope that God will bring history to an end. Finally, they thought, all right, the son of David, let's, let's give up about our hope of the son of David. Human, no human is going to come and rule over us like David did. Right, like David did. We need to give up that. If God is going to establish his kingdom, it must be through him. He must put an end to history and then he must bring his kingdom, not through human beings, was what they started hoping for. Uh, they hope that a powerful act of God will bring an end to this age. This overthrow of evil and the establishment of God's kingdom can be accomplished only by a catastrophic inbreaking of God. Now we, we see, we know volcano erupts, right? But they thought, if God is to rule here and establish his kingdom, what we need is God erupting on earth. All right? What comes out we call erup eruption, but I don't know what comes in. I don't know the opposite of that. Uh, in breaking, God must break the partition, come down and be our king. All right? Be our king. The, the in breaking of God is the only way for our Old Testament hope was what they thought. So they gave up history that God would raise up another David. They gave up that God would restore David forever. It, prophecies like, I will restore the fortunes of Judah and the fortunes of Israel, and I will rebuild them as they were at first. 
Then I will reject the descendants. I will. I would reject the descendants of Jacob and David, my servant, not taking from his descendants ruler over the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But I will restore their fortunes, and I will have mercy on them. They thought, "What is this? Only God can make this happen." These people now hope that God will bring history to an end, that God will usher in a brand new age. During this period, they started developing a. A concept called this age in the age to come. You open the New Testament, you these two expressions, this age and the age to come, is scattered everywhere in the New Testament. You never find them in the Old Testament because these were fruits of reinterpretation of the Bible by the apocalyptics during those periods. People who studied the Scripture, this age. They said this age is evil. God must put this age to an end and start the age to come. They were known as the apocalyptists. They were people who studied, students who studied the scripture. Their hope is that God will step in from outside of history, destroy history, start a new age. Was their hope? They hope that a powerful act of God will bring an end to this age. What they are looking, what they are looking, is the coming age in which God will rule. Remember, rule. The word kingdoms, kingdom means rule. It's not a place of land. So they started hoping. Now we need God to come, break in, start a kingdom, and His rule. The Testament of Dan. It, there were many, many literatures written during this period, but they are not inspired. There is a particular, uh, some examples of people who long for God to come. They thought this age is evil. We need God to come and rule. Some examples here: the Testament of Dan, chapter six, verse four says, "The kingdom of the enemy." All right, this age they say is the kingdom of the enemy. There's another book called the Community Rule, which was also previously called the Manual of Discipline, speaks of this age as the time of the dominion of Belial. Belial is another name for Satan. So this age is the kingdom of the enemy. This age is the dominion in the dominion of Belial, Satan. This overthrow of evil and establishment of God's kingdom can be accomplished only by catastrophic inbreaking. Of God, within this age, they develop new terms like this age and the age to come. The emphasis of the two ages in the New Testament. There are so many verses, but just a few examples. If you read the New Testament, you will come across this. You can never escape noticing these expressions. Matthew 12, Jesus says, "Whoever speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven." But whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven, either in this age or in the age to come. You never find that in the Old Testament. It's all in the New Testament, developed by scholars during the intertestamental period. They divided time into this age and that age. This age is evil, ruled by Satan. That age is good, ruled by God, and it's endless. And we want God to come, start His reign. Was their conclusion. Ephesians 1:21. Far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, above every name that is named, only in this age, not only in this age, but also in the one to come, in the one to come. Titus 2:12. Training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions, to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age. Hebrews 6:5. Have tested the goodness of the word of God and the powers of the age to come. The age to come. Those were just few examples of this age and the age to come. These terms are not found in the Old Testament. There are many in the New Testament. A total of 25 verses in the New Testament. From where? The apocalyptists develop the terms. This is the background of the kingdom of God. This is the background of the kingdom of God. In the dark period of the Jews, 
when they thought that God's kingdom will be here, the son of David will rule. They were ruled by Rome. They lost their throne from 586 BC to the time of Jesus. Right? Over 500 years, there was no throne, no king. And they were longing in the midst of all the oppositions of all these wicked kings. We need God to come and rule. We need God. We need God. We need the Old Testament prophecies. We need God's rule, justice, punishment of the wicked, salvation for the righteous. And then forever we will be with God was their hope. And within that, within that uh, scope, in the context of that, Jesus comes and says, this is the good news of the gospel, right? The good news of the gospel. The gospel, I'm sorry, this is the gospel of the kingdom. Now, in the New Testament, if you read the New Testament carefully, Matthew, Mark, Luke, you will often find an expression called the gospel of the kingdom. Now, that gospel is not the, uh, the gospel that we preach and believe. Our gospel is Jesus died for our sins. That's the version we preach. That's a sort of version. But the gospel of Matthew, Mark, and Luke is different. And so what's the gospel of the gospels? When I say gospels in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, right? What's the gospel of the gospels? What's the gospel of Matthew, Mark, and Luke? It's not about Jesus died for our sins. Jesus went around preaching the gospel of the kingdom. What was it? The gospel was, to understand the gospel, you need to understand the context, the dark ages of the Jews, that we need a king, right? So when God, Jesus comes in flesh and says, this is the arrival of the kingdom, the kingdom is here, it was the greatest news for them. Yes, our king is here. That was the good news that Jesus preached. The good news that Jesus preached is different from the good news that you think is the gospel of God. So some conclusions. Kingdom means the rule and reign of God. The kingdom or rule of God is an Old Testament hope. This age, which is Satan age, Satan's age, is going to be overtaken by God's rule. All right, God's rule. Do, do, do you understand the idea of the kingdom of God? It basically, in chapter 1, what I'm trying to say is that the hope of the Old Testament is not a piece of land. The hope of the Old Testament, the scriptural hope of the kingdom, is the rule or reign of God. Right? However, we often think, when we say the word kingdom, we think of heaven to come. Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come is when you pray that prayer you think of God's heaven to come here that instead of God's I'm sorry instead of God's kingdom coming we're going there right we're going there so when we say your kingdom come you're, we are simply saying please God take care of this well take us to your place is our prayer but that's that's the opposite of what the scripture is trying to say what God is trying to say is God's rule came on earth. The end of history was put in the middle of history. God didn't wait for us to be there. God came in advance, conquered Satan right here in his kingdom, defeated death, established his kingdom so that you and I can be in this massive new scheme of God, new program of God. Our salvation usually is very individualistic. Adam and Eve, God created them. They were sinful. Unfortunately, we all died with Adam. Fortunately, someone came and died for my sins. One day when I die, I will be in heaven. It's all me, my, I. It's all about me going to heaven. It's so, so selfish. I call it selfish eschatology. Selfish soteriology. These are theological words. Our salvation theory is so selfish. And our future hope is so selfish. Somebody died for me, I am going there. And we forget, and we forget that Jesus started God's rule and reign here on earth, and you and I are called to be a part of this new program of God, to redeem this world. 
that some people are so heavenly minded that they are no good on earth here today. They only think for heaven. All our singing is like that. You think about your funeral songs, right? Then I'll be there and then I'll be there, right? I, because we, we are in a Paite church, a song comes to my mind. Tuatiangin, tuatiangin. Remember that? Tuatiangin and noam to di tuatiangin to di. It's all about. I'm so miserable here. There I will have great time with God. But what God wants to say is, God's rule is started here. Live your heavenly life here. Start here. Start here. Don't wait till you get there. You start your heavenly life here. It's not going to be perfect, but you start here. And so this, this study, is, as I promise you, is going to be very, very practical. I don't know how much you will believe it or accept it and allow God to change you, but there is no doctrine or no studies that has changed me more than these studies. And I love these studies and I cannot get tired of preaching and teaching these lessons. The more I teach this, the more I enjoy it. I can talk about this for days, right? At home, when some, some, some will come and visit me, I'll, we'll start talking about this. And I'll be sitting in the beginning, and at the end, I, start, I want to stand up. Uh, even though just one or two, I just want to, you know, I just want to raise my voice. And I'm, I get so excited. This is heaven invading this present evil age. God's rule invading this present evil age. Freeing us from the bondage of Satan. Allowing you to live a victorious Christian life because God rules in your heart. It's God's rule coming. It's not we going to His kingdom. Right? Let's go to the next. Um, we still have some time, an hour. You tired? You okay? <laughs> okay. If you have any question, please, while we're talking, before you forget, jot down, jot it down. And then at the end, we'll have some discussion hour, right? Chapter 2, the kingdom that we are talking about is tomorrow. Tomorrow. When I say tomorrow, I mean future. The kingdom is in the future. There are so many Bible verses in the New Testament that says that the kingdom is in the future. But the problem is there are equal number of verses in the New Testament that says the kingdom which is future is here now today. It's so perplexing. That's why people just give it up. Give up. Say, don't, don't talk about the kingdom of God. It's so confusing. So many verses say the kingdom is here. So many verses say the kingdom is in the future. So just put it away. Box it somewhere. There. All right. We have... We have our own preferences of theological beliefs, all right? If we have a choir here, and we have four parts, right? What if we have five sopranos and one bass and ten tenors? Will that singing be harmonious? No. We need... To adjust the volume, right? We need to adjust the volume. But I want to challenge you today, and we should be honest, that we Christians have raised some verses as though they were speakers, raised the volume of some verses which we love. Like, for by faith we have been saved. Not of work, so that we sh no one should boast. We like those verses. We say, okay, raise this. Raise this volume, right? He who has the Son has eternal life. You raise that volume. But some verses, we reduce the volume, right? Like kingdom. Oh, who can understand that? Justification by faith, we raise that volume. But Romans 2, Paul says, Paul who says in Romans 10, Christ is the end of the law, 
also says in Romans 2, it's the doer of the law who will be justified. Oh, he said, oh, no, 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 keep that away. The doers of the law, so you want us to keep the law? Forget it, keep it, don't read it. Do you know that the, that verse exists in the scripture? The doers of the law will be justified? We don't talk about verses like that. We are guilty of proof texting what we believe. We believe something, and what do you do? You, you look for a verse from the scripture to support what you believe. It's called proof texting. You look for proofs. We are guilty of selecting verses that we like. We have 66 books, but we preach from maybe 15 books normally. Have you ever heard a sermon from Song of Solomon? Have we ever heard a sermon from Ecclesiastes? A sermon from Obadiah? A sermon from Zechariah? We choose what we want. We don't give equal weight to the, to the, the whole counsel of God. All right? It's called, we, the whole counsel of God, the whole scripture is called the canon. But we have canon within the canon of God. We choose only what we want, we talk about those things. But what we're trying to do here is give equal hearing to the verses that are problematic as well in, in, in relation to the kingdom of God. So there are so many verses that say the kingdom is here today, and there are so many verses that say the kingdom is tomorrow, future. Chapter 2 is the first one. The kingdom is tomorrow. The kingdom of God is basically the rule sovereignty of God in action. The kingdom of God is then the realization of God's will and the enjoyment of the accompanying blessings. Yet while this is true, there is a, there is, uh, a very real and very vital sense in which God has already manifested. His reign, His will, His kingdom in the coming of Christ in the flesh by virtue of which we may experience the life of of the kingdom here and now. So, well, the kingdom is in the future, but the coming of the kingdom in the person of Jesus Christ is bringing his reign, his will, his kingdom here on earth. But we'll keep that for the next uh, session. But for now, we, 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 go, we talk about the kingdom as in the future. Some text, Matthew 16 says, Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. This looks to the future, perfect establishment of God's rule in the world. Still future. Matthew 7. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But the one who does the will of the Father who is in heaven. So it's about will enter. It's future. Matthew 8. I tell you, many will come from the east and west and recline at the table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. Still future. Still looks like future. And whoever speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven, but whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven, either in this age or in the age to come. Still future. The Son of Man will send his angels and they will gather out of his kingdom all causes of sin and all lawbreakers. Then the righteous will sign like the sun in the kingdom of God. He who has ears, let him hear. Then the righteous will sign in the kingdom of their father. It's future. Matthew 24. As he sat on the Mount of Olives, his, the disciples came to him privately saying, Tell us, when will these things be? And what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age. It's still future. 24. I will send out his angels with a loud trumpet. He will send out his angels with a loud trumpet call. And they will gather his elect from the four winds and from one end of heaven to the other. Still future. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye. It talks as though we are not yet there. It's it is better for you to enter one day than to be thrown into the lake of fire. 
And Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how difficult it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. It doesn't say you have entered. It says you to, to enter. I say, truly I say to you, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until the day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. Again, future. I will be, he will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord will give to him the throne of his father and his reign over the house of Jacob forever. And his kingdom, there will be no end. Again, all future, all future. Fear not, little flock, for it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom one day, not now. And the people will come from east and west and from north and south and recline at the table in the kingdom of God, not now. Again, I just go through this boom, 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 right? We don't have time. I, would, I wish I had time to explain each verse here, but it will take us a week to do that. Right? We can only do that in the millennium kingdom. For the people in Delhi, you all are so busy. So we get, we'll do what we can within the time we have. Uh, being asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, right? The Jews were so interested in the arrival of the kingdom. All right, you are here. We thought you were going to be the king, but you're here. What we hope was the king will come, destroy the evil, start righteousness. But you're not doing that. So it seems like you're talking about a future kingdom. So they're saying, when would the kingdom come? Jesus said the kingdom of God is not coming in ways that you have observed. It's not coming with thrones and horses. It's in the future who will not receive many times more in this time and in the age to come eternal life. Now, we all say we have eternal life, right? You believe you have eternal life? But this verse, read that verse. When will you receive eternal life? When will you receive eternal life? Eternal life in the age to come, right? Eternal life belongs to the age to come. But we say we receive eternal life today. We do. We do. I'll explain that later on. But we say I, eternal life and the kingdom of God are inseparable. All right? Eternal life is one of the many blessings of the kingdom of God. The rule and reign of God. When that comes, it brings so many good things for us. All the things that God wants to give us is bundled up in the term, the expression, the kingdom of God. But we don't want that yet. We say, oh, the kingdom of God is in the millennium and in the future. But now, right now, I want eternal life. We want the blessing of the kingdom. We don't want the kingdom yet. Right? That's why in the, in the first place we studied Matthew 19, we like eternal life, we like salvation, but we don't like kingdom of heaven or kingdom of God because kingdom means rule. We don't, if you really are serious when the Bible says, seek ye first the kingdom of God, what does it mean? Seek ye first the rule of God in your life here and now. And that we don't want because it's very invading. It destroys my desires, my wills, my little kingdom. I don't want to surrender. So we say, keep that away. We, we accept terms that are not demanding eternal life, salvation. We don't want invasive words, the rule and reign of God, right? If, if you just understand that and apply it, it's enough of blessing for today. You can go home. Okay? And be changed at home. Your home will become a little kingdom of God where God rules within your marriage among your children. God's rule and reign in your workplaces. Everywhere you exercise that. All right? <clears throat> but still, it's talked in terms of future. Matthew 19, is, uh, as they heard these things, he proceeded to tell a parable because he was near to Jerusalem because they supposed that the kingdom of God was about to appear. And he said, therefore, a nobleman 
a nobleman went in, into a far country to receive a kingdom for himself and then return. It's about somebody going away and coming back with power one day, not now. The Jews were thinking Jesus is going to do it now. And Jesus says, I'm going away. And one day I'll come back as a son of David on the throne of David and rule its future. I assign to you as my father assigned to me a kingdom that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. And this is not here. One day you will be on the throne, on 12 thrones. Right? Jesus said, remember, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. The thief on the cross, the, the criminal on the cross, also thought these are all Jewish thinking, all right? They thought, he also thought Jesus is going to come one day and that will be the kingdom. At the moment, no kingdom was what they thought. That's why he is saying, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Ephesians 2, 7, so that in the, age, in the coming ages, in the coming ages, he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. One day, there is, a, there is, a, there is a, an eternity where we call the, the coming age. And there, everything will be perfect. He will show his gr great kindness to us. We have tasted the goodness of the word of God and the powers of the age to come. The age to come is there, but now we just taste, right? Tasting is not full dinner, right? But it's real. So what we do now is tasting the power of the kingdom to come, the age of the kingdom to come, meaning that the kingdom is in the future. The kingdom is in the future. In such passages, the kingdom of God is equivalent to that aspect of eternal life which will be experienced only after the coming of Christ. So in all these verses, they seem to say that the kingdom of God is in the future. Is in the future. Peter says, for in this way there will be richly provided for you an entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Right? So providing an entrance into the kingdom is still in the future. Peter talks to his believers, his followers, and he says, if you do these things, you will enter into the kingdom of God. My kingdom is not of this world. Right? It's in the future. I do not think that we have any problem with these verses because we all think the kingdom is future. But the real problem is in going to be in the next chapter and it's the most important chapter for today. 1 Corinthians 15, 50, I tell you this, brothers, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. So we are still in the flesh and blood, so we still cannot inherit the kingdom of God because it belongs to the future. Revelation 11:15. when the seven angels blow, blew his trumpet and there were loud voices in heaven saying, the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ. One day, it's not now, it's going to be one day. <clears throat> going back to Matthew 19, eternal life is equal to the kingdom of God, is equal to the kingdom of heaven, is equal to salvation. They are interchangeable terms. In verse 19, Jesus says, everyone, of 29, Jesus says, everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or fathers or mothers or children or lands for my name's sake will receive a hundredfold and inherit eternal life. So, inheriting it, kingdom of God, inheriting eternal life, getting salvation, they are all one and the same one and the same see the parallel verses in mark truly i say to you there is no one who has left houses or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or land for my name's sake and for my gospel for the gospel who will not receive a hundredfold now in this time 
houses and brothers and sisters and brothers and children and lands with persecution and in the age to come eternal life in the age to come eternal life by comparing these passages we discover that eternal life the kingdom of god the kingdom of heaven salvation and the age to come all belong together they are in a box and bundle for the future they are the promise of the future for those who in this age have become disciples of Christ. In this age, if you are a disciple of Christ, all these things are promised for the future. For the future. Eternal life belongs to the age to come. In this age, eternal, in, that age in the age to come, eternal life, right? So eternal life belongs to the future. Today you say you have eternal life, and I, I, I believe so. I also believe I have eternal life, but it's not perfect. I want to disturb some of our beliefs this morning. You say you have eternal life, but you will die one day. Which means your eternal life is still not perfect. Right? We should be studying the scripture. Don't be satisfied with little things that we have learned. Although they are so important. Right? We should be reformed. In reforming, right? Our forefathers walked away from Roman Catholicism. And they were reformers. We are so thankful for them. But don't just simply believe what your church, what our parents have taught us. We should be reformed in reforming. Every day we continue to change. Otherwise, you become a tradi traditionalist very quickly, right? Reformed and reforming is my theme. Right? In my life, in my personal life, I always like the idea of reform and reforming. Right? In terms of theology and practice as well, or music or everything else, reformed and reforming. In 1919, these keyboards were considered worldly music. All right? They were never used in churches, but today they are here. We should be reformed and reforming. Reforming. Time will come when everybody will wear your pins like this big, right? Long, long ago our, our forefathers did. But the, it has changed. Reform and reforming. And in, in theology, that's the same. Don't stick to your traditional beliefs. Let's study the scripture together. When we pursue this study further, we find the kingdom of God, like the age to come, will follow the resurrection. All right? The kingdom of God is in the future, right? As far as we know today, at this point. And then, there is another thing. The, the kingdom of God is in the future, but we don't know how, when. But one thing we know from the scripture is that that kingdom of God will be preceded by resurrection. All right? So let's try to put some timeline, some events leading to the kingdom of God. The first thing we know is that before the kingdom of God comes, there must be a resurrection. That's what we see in 1 Corinthians 15, 50. Paul says that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. That means you must be raised first to, to get into the kingdom of God. Paul is here speaking about the resurrection. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Our bodies must undergo a transformation so that they no longer consist of flesh and blood but are incorruptible, glorious, powerful spiritual bodies. In order to enter into the new age of God, the new creation of God, we need new creation here. We need to be recreated. Uh, we'll come to that later on, how much the New Testament emphasizes about new creation here. I'm a new creation of God. You need to be transformed to be qualified to enter into the New wall, the new heaven and new earth, the kingdom of God, you may say. There are different expressions of this one and the same thing. Only in these transformed resurrection bodies will we enter the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God will come after the resurrection. So first we have place and event. All right? You know when the kingdom will come, it will come after resurrection. In the parable of the weeds, we find that the kingdom of God will be introduced by the day of judgment. 
All right? So after the, uh, the, the kingdom of God will be introduced by the day of judgment, Matthew 13. Judgment, the sheep and the goat judgment, Matthew, right? You know that one. The sheep and the goat judgment first and then the righteous into the kingdom of God. And therefore we know that another event that will precede the kingdom of God is the judgment of God. At the harvest, at the end of the age, there will be separation of judgment. Then comes the righteous. Then sell the righteous sign forth as a son into the kingdom of their father. Right? When we trace age in the New Testament, this age in the New Testament, we discover, we discover that in the course of God's redemptive purpose, there are two ages which are frequently called this age and the age to come. Ephesians 1.21, Paul describes the exaltation of Christ far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but in that which is to come, in that which is to come. Mark 10, I say, truly I say to you, there is no one who has left, we have read that one, in this age and in the age to come again. When we trace this concept further, we discover that these two ages are separated by the second coming of Christ, right? We, I have just said that these two ages, this age and the age to come, is separated by resurrection. You must be raised to enter into the kingdom of God. But the second thing we find is that before the kingdom of God, there must be the second coming of Christ. So we're trying to put some events leading up to the kingdom of God. So the kingdom, the second coming of Christ and the resurrection of the dead are the two events, right? Matthew 24, disciples came to Jesus with the question, tell us when will this be and when will this be? Your kingdom, when will this be? And what shall be the sign of your coming in the close of the age? The question had to do with the consummation of this age which will be followed by another age. When will this age end? When will the new age start right the new age start that's what the disciples are asking the first thing is the second coming of christ and it will be followed by the age to come another event dividing this age from the age to come is the resurrection from the dead look jesus says the son of this age marry and are given in marriage but those who are considered worthy to attain to that age and, the re and to the resurrection from the dead neither marry nor are given in marriage for they cannot die anymore because they are equal to angels and are sons of God being sons of the resurrection. So the two events that separates us this, that separate this age and the age to come are the second coming of Christ and the resurrection of the dead until you have the two we will never enter the kingdom of God in full in full right keep that in mind in full so here our Lord refers to two ages this age and the age to come <clears throat> let's uh, see this C stands for creation at the, from the far left. And P for parousia is a theological term, meaning the second coming of Christ. R stands for the resurrection of Christ. And then we have the age to come. This age and the age to come is separated by two very important events. The second coming of Christ and the resurrection of Christ. Then only the kingdom of God will come in uh, in full. And so it means that these two ages, it means that these two ages are in conflict. And so let me explain that. The conflict of the ages. When we ask what scripture teaches about the character of these two ages, we find a sharp contrast. This age is dominated by evil, wickedness, rebellion against the will of God. In this age, there is rebellion. In that age, there is the reign of God. Peace, holiness, right? So there is a conflict. While the age to come is the age of the rule of God, the present age is evil. 
But the kingdom of God belongs to the age to come. This age had its beginning in creation. But the age to come will go endlessly. This age will end. That age will never end. We may therefore speak of the age to come as eternity, by which we mean unending time. Unending time. This, in this age, there is death. In the kingdom of God, eternal life. Right? In this age, the righteous and the wicked are mixed together. In the kingdom of God, all wickedness and sin will be destroyed. For the present, Satan is viewed as the god of this age. 2 Corinthians 4.4 4, Satan is the god of this age. But in the age to come, God's kingdom, God's rule will have destroyed Satan and righteousness will displace all evil. It's the biblical teaching that we shall never experience the full blessings of God's kingdom in this age. In this age, you will never experience the full blessings of the kingdom of God. We pray, we do, we preach, we sing, but God's kingdom will never be experienced fully here on earth. People who fix their hopes upon the kingdom, which is to be consummated in this age, are certain to be disillusioned. Some people hope that God is going to establish His kingdom here. They will be shattered, just like the Old Testament hope. It's not going to come in full here on earth. The perfected kingdom of God belongs to the age to come. Age to come. We shall never know the fullness of its blessings so long as these age last. Right? As long as this age continues, we shall never understand the full meaning of the, of the kingdom of God, the age to come. There will be no worldwide conversion this side of the coming of Christ. That side of the coming of Christ. But now we are in this side of the coming of Christ. And in this side of the coming of Christ, there is not going to be worldwide conversion. Because, remember, we'll talk about that if we have time. Remember, the wheat and the weeds will grow together. Right? The weeds and the, and the, and the wheat will grow together. And the, and the workers say, should we go and pluck out the weeds? And the master said, no, let them grow together until harvest. And Jesus explains at the end, Matthew, Matthew 13, the, the wheat are the sons of the kingdom. The weeds, the grass, are the sons of the evil one. People who will harvest are the angels. The time of harvest will be the end of the age, this age. And until the end of this age, we have conflict in the kingdom of God. There is conflict. So we live in the midst of war. In the midst of war. We live in the conflict of the ages. The kingdom of God is not going to be, this age is not going to come like this and that age is not going to join like this. And there is no separate separation altogether. But what we are going to find is that as the kingdom, as this age continues, the age to come advances, invades this age. And then God starts His kingdom a kingdom which should be at the end of this age, this history, at the end of history is transplanted in the middle of history and there is conflict of the two ages. The God of this age, the God of this world is being defeated and then people are choosing sides. And whose side are you going to be? Right? It's like playing football like if if these sides the two sides play against this side and even though you are many this side they're professional footballers they have scored 50 goals and the time is only five minutes left and you have scored zero only five minutes left 
goal score is 50 0 but do you think that this side will end the match without any injury can bad things happen in 5 minutes why not right why not it's defeated in 5 minutes there is no way that you are going to score 51 goals it's defeated but the defeated foe can still inflict trouble on their side. There can still be broken legs. Satan is like that. This age, his age, is being invaded by another powerful age. And that's why Jesus said in Matthew 12, If I cast out demons by the hand of God, know that the kingdom of God is here. How can... A man go walk into someone else's house and steal away his things until the strong man is bound, right? Now, when Jesus says that the strong man is bound, what is he trying to say? What Jesus is trying to say is that the strong man is the devil, Satan. The stronger one has come. He is binding the strong man, releasing men who were possessed and controlled by demons from his kingdom. The real exodus, right? The real final new exodus. The exodus from Pharaoh was not the final. The Passover in Egypt was not the final. But the final Passover of Jesus Christ, the new covenant, the Jesus who died for his own Passover, he says at the Passover night, this is the blood of my covenant. The final new Exodus is going to release us from the power of Pharaoh, from the power of Satan, and release us from his power and dominion, and we will be in the reign of God, in the reign of God. And that's what we are going to, trying to study uh, today. Um, we have 20 minutes before I start uh, the next um, lesson the next chapter but let's conclude uh, this session with some concluding remarks therefore we ought not to be disillusioned by wars and rumors of wars by evils and by hostility to the gospel right when you go out and preach and people are hostile to you and to the gospel do not be discouraged right there is the conflict of the ages there is still there there is still there don't be discouraged when God's people are called upon to pass through severe punishment, sufferings and tribulations, don't think that God's reign is over. When we are discouraged, when we face afflictions and trials, don't think, don't think they, they should remember, we should remember that God has not abandoned us. God has not abandoned us. That, but that their sufferings are due to the fact that they no longer belong to this age. Do you understand that? Why do we suffer as Christians? We didn't suffer like that before. We suffer now. Why? Because you, even though you are still in this age, you don't belong to this age anymore. That's why you suffer. Do you understand that? You belong to the age to come. That's why the owner of this age hates you. And you suffer. There is persecution. So when you are suffering and there is tribulation, there is sickness and separation, death and decay and hospital and funeral and cemetery, you should remember that we don't belong to this age. And in this age, we suffer. And that's why the, dev the, the devil hates us because we are no longer his people. We are the object of his hostility, his hostility. Furthermore, the kingdom of God will never be fully realized apart from the personal, glorious, victorious coming of Christ. Okay, man cannot build the kingdom of God. Christ will bring it. We cannot build the kingdom of God. The rule of God, whenever I say the word kingdom, think of the rule. And then, in your mind, put that rule and reread your New Testament where it says, seek ye first the kingdom of God. What does that mean then? Seek ye first the kingdom of God means what? Seek ye first the? 
rule of God here and now in your life. And it puts a whole new dimension of understanding of your New Testament. It's not seek heaven. Think about going to heaven. Talk, some people are so good at that. You meet somebody and say, are you safe? You, you sure you'll go to heaven when you die? Forget that. Don't live for the future. Now, live for God. Live for God. As important as heaven is, heaven is temporary. At the end, we are not going to be in heaven. At the end, the Bible doesn't say we will be in heaven with God forever. Bibles, what the Bible says in Revelation 21 is there is a loud shout in heaven. And it says, now the dwelling place of God is among men. It's not saying, now man is with God. God wants to dwell with us. That's what he did in the Eden Garden. That's what he did in the Old Testament. The tabernacle, the temple, and Jesus Christ, the church. And forever we, he will be with us in the new earth. New heaven and new earth. Heaven is a temporary place where you and I will be if the Lord tarries in our bodiless self. Bodiless self. Second Corinthians, Paul says that that's like feeling naked. Paul says, I want to be cloth. I don't want to live without my cloth. Living in heaven without my body is like naked. That's what Paul says. I want to be cloth. This, this tabernacle, this body will go through decay. And during that period, we will be in heaven. But we are so fascinated by heaven. All our dreams and visions and studies is about heaven. Will you go to heaven? Will you go to heaven? Which is a temporary place. One day, He will be with us forever in new heaven and new earth. All right? In our full bodies, where we will not be able to sin. Eden, the first garden was where we were not able to sin. The last garden will be where we are not able to sin. And it's going to be a perfect place. And that Christ will bring. You cannot build it. You and I cannot build it. The power of Satan and evil can be finally overcome only by the mighty act of the return of Christ. Right? It's powerful. We don't deny that. Satan is powerful. His forces are powerful. The desires he brings in our hearts are powerful. But that destruction can only happen with the mighty return mighty act of the return of Christ. And that day is coming. The Word of God urges us to watch, to be awake, to be ready and waiting for that day. What assurance, what comfort, what stability it gives us to our hearts and minds to know that our prayer will certainly be answered. Thy kingdom come, right? Thy, thy rule come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Lord, come. Should be our prayer. Lord, come. But the next, the next chapter, the kingdom is today, is going to say, yes, it has come here. And chapter 3 can be explained as the heart of our studies, right? The heart of our studies. So far, up to this point, where I'm, I'm just, what I'm doing is providing the background and our common framework and within this framework we are going to say the kingdom of God is here right? the rule of God is here there is going to be the eruption of the rule of God when we get to chapter 3 so let's take a quick break and then we will start with chapter 7 after the break thank you very much